there on the uh, special, and we just have Dr. Gip come right now. You come on, my brother. Teachers, God bless you. Well, amen, amen. Well, good to be saved. Good to be in church. Man, it's already been good to be in church, hasn't it? I don't know if you get excited about hearing me, but I don't. So that made that very special. Uh, could I say something to the young men that were singing and the young men that are in college? You know, a call to preach manifests itself as three, one of three offices, as a missionary, a pastor, or an evangelist. Uh, you can manufacture something else, puppets for Jesus, or, you know, shadow figures, or whatever you want to do. <laughs> Let me tell you what we desperately need. We need warriors for Christ. I see in this 20, 30-something generation guys that want to be IT men for God. They want to be God's negotiators. Uh, these guys don't want, they don't want anybody to dislike them. I got news for you guys. I don't like people disliking me. But there ought to be somebody that dislikes you if you're going to do God's work. And so if you've got that crazy, here's what a bunch of young men think. Why step down to a pulpit and preach to 100 people when I'm going to make a video that's going to affect the entire world for Christ on the Internet? That is not what God, God planned on. He planned on preaching. And so uh, that's, just, that's just free, okay? Uh, I want to mention this about the book table. Somebody asked if we take credit cards. Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we had the last one for three weeks. <laughs> I, I may not look like Mary Smith, but I was for three weeks, okay? It, it suddenly quit working halfway through a fill-up on my RV, but... Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so we do. My wife is out there. If you don't, Kipper, would you stand up? This is my wife. Amen. That's a good lady, guys. That is a good lady. She, uh, this August, will be married 45 years. I assume that will make you pray a lot harder for her. I told her, I said, you must have been wicked in a former life to have to marry me in this one. She, I, said, I said, you ever divorce me? I'm going to testify on your behalf. I will get in front of that judge and say, give it all to her. I know what she's been through. But um, she'll be there to take your money. And I told you, we've married almost 45 years. I can't testify. That woman knows how to take money. I, uh, it's kind of a blessing for me to see her taking somebody else's, if you want the truth. Um, I will talk to you tonight about why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, I want you to go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Let me tell you why I, why I don't, uh, what is not the reason that I believe. Uh, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but not because that's what I was taught in Bible college. Have you ever thought about this? Of course, have you ever thought? But um, have, you ever, have you ever thought about this? We have, we have Bible doctrines that we believe, correct? Okay, then didn't there have to be at one time no doctrine? No doctrine, no, no Bible, no doctrine, right? And then God gave us the written word of God, and as men got into that book, we began to find the doctrines of God. We would not know about creation, but that the Bible tells us about it. Uh, and various doctrines, of course, uh, you know, we think uh, the, the big ones for us that are personal or salvation by grace, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, uh, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the second coming. But did you ever think about this? You know, if, if what we believe is really true, then we could take it, set it aside, and go to the Bible and find it again. Right? You know, I went to Bible college back in 1970. 1970. And, um, and here's the conclusion. I've just been saved, told you, it's been, just been saved 10 weeks. Uh, and I figured this out real quick. I said, if this, if my teacher can teach me the Bible and not be wrong anywhere, if there's, if everything he teaches is 100% right, he's God. And I knew he wasn't God. Now, let me tell you, this is, this is humanity. When I came to that conclusion, I thought, okay, I'll find out where he's wrong. I'll change it and correct it. Then I'll be God. Well, that is what you think, isn't it? And the reason I say that is because uh, we're all going to believe something wrong. We've got to be wrong somewhere, okay? Now, I keep that in mind because that helps, your, that helps your, your pride, your humility. You know, you think you can't be wrong? Well, see right there, we already found yours. But, um, 
And, and I figured this, you know, I, I tell people I, I got rid of the King James Bible when I was attending a King James Bible uh, believing uh, a Bible college because the man that led me to Christ believed the King James Bible. The church that I got saved in believed the King James Bible. And the college I was going to believed the King James Bible. Three of the worst reasons to believe the King James Bible. So I put it away and I just put them all in a ring and this one threw all the rest of them out of the ring. Okay? And, and came out. Uh, you know, Robert Dick Wilson. Robert Dick Wilson was the mentor to uh, David Otis Fuller. And Robert Dick Wilson, uh, I got to paraphrase him. I read it back in 1978 or 79. I read this. But uh, uh, he basically, when he, he did, listen to what this man did. In his, in his young years, he, he broke his future life into three 15-year segments. And he said, for 15 years, I will study the subject of the Bible. For 15 years, I will collate my last 15 years' work. And for 15 years, I'll teach it. That's exactly what he did. And he said it something to this effect. He said, when you begin this study, he said, you're just a little bit fearful, a little bit apprehensive, that when you really start looking under the rocks and looking everywhere, you're going to find out you're believing the wrong thing. He said, then as you do your research, he said, what happens is you start finding another reason and another reason and another reason. He said, pretty soon you're exhilarated and you come out not only believing that the Bible is Word of God, but for far more reasons than you started when you, or had when you started. Guys, that's why I tell people, you know, uh, if, if the last thing you learned from the Bible was in Bible college, what have you been doing? You know, um, uh, I, I have three answers when, uh, when I think about what I was taught in Bible college. Uh, somebody says, uh, here's what they say, what do you say? And I say, here's, because you are allowed. Listen, Bible colleges are allowed to be correct. I mean, they are allowed, you know. And I'll say, here's what I was taught in Bible college. And after I reviewed it on my own, I see they were correct. Or I'll say, here's what I was taught, and I reviewed it, and I don't think they were right. And here's what I was taught, and I've never had to confront this subject myself, so here's what I was taught. I, I don't know what else to tell you. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't experienced that, I, and I haven't had to do that study, so I don't know. But, but here's what it is. And so, guys, I, am, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, but not because that's what the school that I went to believed. Guys, if all you're going to do, you know, I, I say this. I can't get over how, how much we are, uh, we are this list, this, this sheet of paper with convictions. You think a conviction is a line on a piece of paper, the yes or no box, and as long as you check all the right boxes, yes, you're okay. I got it down, I checked all the yeses. Guys, that's not it. You had better be reading and reading and reading your Bible. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. A message, I can't remember the first time I preached it, but it has been rewritten two other times. You say, why? Because I found more reasons. Okay? By the way, this thing was written before there was a mid-tribulation rapture uh, controversy, okay? Because I believed before then, uh, and I just got more reasons to now. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, why don't you just take a look at, uh, well, let me see, let me see. Let's, uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 1. I said Revelation chapter 4. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. We'll just read every word from here all the way to the end of the book. <laughs> or we could take a rather large offering right now and I, we just <laughs> maybe just read two verses and let you go home. <clears throat> That'd get an offering out of you. Because uh, I want to point something out very, very important uh, in these uh, first three chapters. Verse, uh, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the author of these words. Lord, it's good to be in church. And I, I can say this, God. I hope I speak for these people. It's already been good to be in church tonight. The, the, um, the orchestra, what they played, is beautiful. What the uh, college choir sang, Lord, I was blessed. I have been blessed. And so, Lord, I thank you so much. God, this church, I, 
You know what I really hope, God? I really hope that just a regular, if I can say it, run-of-the-mill church member of this church realizes what they're part of and what they can be part of. And so God bless the people of this church and let them realize, Lord, they, have, they are really a part of something that they can get something on the other side for just coming here and just getting involved. So, so thank you, God, that we could be in church tonight. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, for some shaky years for a while, it never, never really, really uh, uh, didn't know what was going to happen, but uh, we feel a little more confident in our government now. But our confidence is not in our government. Our confidence is in you. And so, God, please be in this service. Claim it for yourself. This is your service. God, I pray for these people that you will get Sam Gipp out of your way and out of their way, that you'll speak to each uh, person here, touch their lives, God, and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, I want to show you, I'll read this verse again because I like this verse. It says, uh, John to the seven what? Okay. Now, I am of the, I, am of the uh, I guess you could say teaching, preaching, uh, uh, position, belief, whatever. You know, it's kind of a general teaching that the seven churches of Revelation kind of correspond with seven periods of time uh, from the time of Christ to today, leaving us at the church age uh, or, or the Laodicean church, uh, which is where we are. Laodicea is what? People's rights. Oh, guys, is this not it? Is this not the age of people's rights? I came into this church one time. This lady walked up to me. She was kind of indignant with her pastor and indignant with the church. And she said, do you know what they did here? Well, I didn't, but I... I had this prophetic spirit sweep, sweep over me thinking that I'm about to find out. And I said, uh, no, what'd they do? She said, she said this serious. She said, they painted the bathrooms and no one asked me what color I thought they should be. Now, you know, there is a benefit to not being the pastor and not even being a church member. And I said, you, you can say things, you know, because if I make you mad, if I make you mad this week, I'm, I'm beating feet Thursday. I'm out of here, pal, okay? And I said, she said, they never asked me what I thought. And I said, um, well, maybe they didn't care. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of, that kind of, that kind of had a, a cooling effect on our fellowship right there. <laughs> which was a real blessing because that way she didn't speak to me the rest of the week, which I am sure was a blessing to me. I don't care about her. But they say, what is that? That's people's rights. Well, nobody asked me what I thought. Well, that's because nobody ever knew you thought. (laughs) Now, I want you to see this. I want you to go flip on over to chapter 4. And again, guys, you know, there are some standard teachings. They've been around before you and I ever showed up. And you are allowed to be suspicious of them. But, but, But don't say... Well, that's what I was taught, so it's got to be wrong. But don't say that's what I was taught, so it's got to be right. And a classic teaching is Revelation chapter 4. Look what it says. After this, verse 1, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a, a trumpet uh, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter immediately. I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat uh, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, I will tell you this, I like this chapter so much, I could really read it all the way to the end. It's a good chapter. But guys, here's the standard teaching. Uh, before, before I ever got saved, they say, chapter 1, 2, and 3, uh, you have church, 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 seven churches, Then you have come up hither in chapter 4, and the church is never found again in Revelation. And that's insinuating that uh, after chapter 4, the the, the local church, the the, the church has been called out of here, and then all the trouble comes to the earth. Hey, guys, I've looked at it. I was taught that. You know what? I think think they're right. But let me explain something to you. Now, you guys may not have a problem with this. Somebody listening may have a problem with this. Some, some doofus that is, uh, you know, he's got his house church or his garage church or whatever he's got or, or his internet church or stay home. Hey, you know, I got, a, I got my own YouTube channel. I got over 110 sermons on it or lessons. And, and I tell people I didn't put one of those on the internet for anybody in this room to stay home and watch my stuff or listen to my stuff instead of coming here. And if you do that, I hope right in the middle of it, your computer crashes. 
Because I, I don't have anything on there to be in competition to what God established in the local church. Now, guys, I write books. And, and if anything you know when you write a book, you know what you know? All, they all got to have a last chapter. Okay, some of them have been, they had like five chapters too late to have a last chapter, but I've read some of those books. But, um, but here's this. Whatever you do in this, whatever you do in this book, you got a line of thought going here, and you got a line of thought going here, and you got one coming around here. But when you get to the last chapter, you know what you got to do? You have got to bring it all together, right? Okay, what's the last book of the Bible? It is? I thought it was concordance. Man, that blew my whole message. Okay, my second point. <laughs> Revelation is the last book of the Bible, right? God put this book together. When he gets to Revelation, this is the end, correct? Think about this, people. When you get to the very end of time, God is still going to be dealing with local churches. I've had people say, well, God's done, and or we've done an end, end run around the local church. Go ahead and do an end run around it, because local church doesn't need you anyway. You did an end run around the church. You did an end run around God's plan. Go ahead and do anything you want, pal, but it wasn't of God. And people say, well, God's done with the local church. You haven't shown me that in the Bible. What I just showed you is that at the end of this age, at the end of time, God is going to end still dealing with local churches. So if you want to be where God's going to be working, I'd be in a church. I am strong local church. Now, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, uh, uh, brown nose and anything. I believe in local church. I have several large metropolitan areas. Chicago isn't one of them. It isn't one of them. But I've got several large cities. L.A. is one of them. Rochester, New York. There's some other places uh, uh, down in Norfolk, Virginia. I've got several cities where I preach in more, sometimes a half a dozen different independent Baptist churches. And I've had people say, why don't you get those all together in an auditorium and just have one meeting and save yourself? It would help me. I'll be honest. It would help me. Instead of having to be in that place for six weeks, I'll get it all done in one week and wow, the offering. You know, I just can't in good conscience do it. I don't think it's bad. I'm, you know, if somebody else did that, I'm not saying that's bad. I don't think it's, uh, it, it's anti-God or whatever. I just don't have peace with it. You say, well, I just like being in church. And when I say being in a local church, I mean, guys, I preached in churches like this one. I, I, pre I preached in converted gas stations, in converted uh, biker bar. Uh, I preached in houses literally with my back against the wall. Uh, and uh, I am preached in a chicken coop. A chicken coop that got converted. Smallest sanctuary I've ever been in. But, um, but guys, here's what you got. You come to the book of Revelation, the last book in this Bible, you know that it's all about the tribulation, and you got, you got the, the, church, the local church in chapter 1, 2, 3. In chapter 4, you've got come up hither, then the trouble starts, and we are gone. That church does not appear anyplace else in the book of Revelation. Hey, guys, got to be something to that. In fact, there is so much something to that that the guy in Phoenix doesn't even, he pretends that's not even there. You know, uh, you know, I am a teacher, and, uh, and I'm a writer, and I wrote a couple of Bible commentaries. And You know when you start teaching, and, and there's always a, a problem passage. And if you're writing, uh, or even if you're preaching, and you don't have an answer to explain, what you do is you get to that place that's called snowball and just talk a lot. Uh, you know, I will say, uh, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, uh, what does... Uh, what does John 3.16 say? Quote it, and, and I'll get down to that, and it'll say, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth this continent, a new nation dedicated to the proposition. Because they don't know what John 3.16 says, so they just figure, I'll just write a lot. Who's going to check this? Man, I've had up to 75 students in my class, 25 questions per test. I check 25 questions, uh, answers on 75 tests, because that's my job. But when they do that, I, my time is precious to me. I don't care what you, what you think of your time. I don't care what you think of mine, but my time is precious to me. And I could have saved myself a lot of time if this fool would have just left blank. I could check it wrong. I'm going to check it wrong anyway. Save me some time. So I put in parentheses in red because no other color could be so impactful. And so I put in red, don't snowball. Or you just come down to the verse, the, the problem text, you know, 
and you, you go, verse 1, maybe it's verse 5. Verse 1, here's my comments. Verse 2, here's my comments. Verse 3, here's my comments. Verse 4, here's my comments. Verse 6, here's my comments. Verse 7, here's my comments. You say, you just missed 5. Yeah, I watched the guy one time. I knew what he believed. I knew what the Bible said. And they were at loggerheads. The Bible said one thing, and he believed another. That's not a problem as long as you don't preach from that or teach from that, that, uh, that chapter that had the very verse that un unwound his doctrine. And so I said, man, I got to see what this guy's going to do when he gets to that verse. And he got down to the, the verse, two verses above it. He got down to the verse above it. And then he went to the verse below it. And I thought, did he not see? I mean, it was the one verse. It was the most controversial verse in the chapter. And this guy just stepped over top of it. That's what, that's what uh, that Anderson guy does with this passage right here. He avoids this like work. But guys, I am telling you that, the, that God is dealing with local churches in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4. You have come up hither. You don't find the local church. All of the trouble, first half or last half, doesn't matter, whole tribulation, all seven years, you don't find the word church in there anyway. Guys, wouldn't you think if somebody was there, God would mention them? You say, well, that's awful simplistic. Sometimes things are simple. Simple. I, am a, I personally believe truth is simple, okay? I was, uh, I was talking to a fellow. He was on a, he was on a uh, what do you call it, pulpit committee. Their pastor had left, and, uh, and he was on a pulpit committee. And this one guy candidated for that church, and really, I'm not sure he's really a Bible believer, but he would be one to, when he preached there so he could get the pulpit. And my wife said, do you know who candidate that church? And I said, who? And she told me. And I said, well, he's not a King James Bible believer. She goes, I know. She goes, you ought to call him. You ought to call that public committee. I said, no. I said, they got four good men on there. If he can get past them, they deserve him. Yeah. Had the public committee called me. His name was Gary. He says, brother, we had so-and-so in. What do you think? And I said, well, did you ask him what he said, believes about the King James Bible? He goes, yeah. I said, what did he say? And he said, he said, well, he said this, this. He said he talked about 20 minutes. And when he was done, we still didn't know if he believed the King James Bible or not. Now, look, guys, I am a believer that yes or no questions have yes or no answers. I, I will grant you the grace that if you want to explain your yes or your no, I'll give you that. I'm going to say you always have to say yes, no. You may have to say, now look, here's why my, my answer is yes, or here is why my answer is no. But at the end of your spiel, you ought to come out with yes or no. Amen. So I said, so uh, what would you do? He said, well, we asked him again. I said, what did he do? He said, well, he talked about another 20 minutes. I said, so how would it go? He said, well, when he was done, he said, I said, uh, he said we still didn't know what he believed. I, he said, what do you think? I said, Gary, are you Calvinist? He goes, no. I said, how long did it take you to answer that? He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it nice to see the light come on? I mean, it might be 50 watts. It just takes a while to wind up. But guys, what I'm telling you is that classic teaching before you and I were around was that the first three chapters about the local church, which they are, and, and, and then chapter four, you got come up hither, church ain't around anymore. I believe that. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because I set it aside. I didn't say I quit believing it. I was willing to set it aside and come objectively to my Bible. And you know what my Bible did? My Bible brought me back to what I was taught in Bible college. So I am a pre-tribulation rapturist because I believe the church is gone before the tribulation starts. Uh, I believe I'm a pre-tribulation rapture because the tribulation is punishment to the world and to the Jews. Those are the two. God is not dealing with the church. God deals with the church now. Doesn't he say he chastises us now? He sure does. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, and this just beginning, verse 4, it said, and there went out another horse uh, that was red, and power was given to him uh, that, he, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. 
Now, he didn't say peace from the south, peace from the north, peace from the east, peace from the west. He didn't say uh, take peace from the United States or peace from, the, from Russia. Or, you know what he said? Planet Earth. You know what I always say? I always say that, that the tribulation is going to be seven years of the earth being a free fire zone from God. I was going to mention this to you this morning and my, my, my Alzheimer's kicked in. I was telling you about a sidebar. Have you ever thought about this? Probably when, when the Lord sets up the millennium. Now, now, let me ask you, have you ever seen were, uh, pictures of like Germany right after World War II? What did you see? Rubble. You ever see Hiroshima right after the bomb? Okay. Did you ever stop and think probably the first hundred years of the millennium is going to be rebuilding? I'll bet it's going to be, look, in the millennium, start a construction company. What do you think is going to happen when 50-pound blocks of ice fall out of the sky? You say, there's not going to be 50-pound blocks of ice. You're absolutely right. I cut it by two pounds. It's a talent, 52 pounds. What do you think 52 pounds of ice, I mean hailstones weighing 52 pounds would do to this building? You, hey, you may have some reinforcement, but I'm telling you, this, this world is going to look like Hiroshima and Germany after World War II. And you say, why? Because this world has been cruel to this God. You know how if you don't believe there's a, a God and a devil, yeah, I'm serious, if you really are out there and you don't believe there's a God, you don't believe there's a devil, and you hold this whole thing, you know how you should know that, this, this, that what we say is true? Because whenever the world looks for an answer, they don't come to the Bible. How would you think that, that if, if the world didn't believe there was a God, that at least the Bible would be one of the options? Sure. What if we went to our government and said this, hey, I got this thing. Uh, it, it, this thing, um, uh, people get off drugs, uh, men quit beating their wives, uh, they don't molest their children, people quit killing each other, uh, they get work, they go to work, they're honest. You say, yeah, man, that's what we need. What is it? Well, just let us tell them about Jesus Christ because once they get saved, that's what they do. You know what they'd say? Oh, no, we don't want that. You know what our country wants? Let me tell you exactly what this country wants. This country wants the benefits of Christianity, the fruits of Christianity without Jesus Christ. But really, really, if there is an absolute honest atheist, and I'm not sure you can use honest and atheist in the same sentence in the, that order, but uh, if there was actually an honest atheist, you know what he ought to say? Well, you ought to do meditation. Uh, you ought to try yoga. Uh, and you know, if this, is, if this works for you, you ought to give Christianity a try. That might, might do it. But this is never an option. And this world has walked on this God. This world has burned God's people. This world has crucified God's people. This world has tortured God's people. This world, hey, they have got things out there where they portray Jesus Christ as a pervert and as every other kind of thing on this planet. And you know what God, and is this not a gracious God? Yeah. Buddy, I'm telling you, is he not long-suffering? Is he not merciful? Is he not gracious? But you know, there's going to be a come a time when he says, I can't take another drop, and he is going to unload on this world for seven years. Now, I don't know. If you're one of these people, you, you are a fool. Uh, I hear some guys, they talk about tribulation, and it's three and a half years and three and a half years, uh, and, and they kind of make the first half just sound like nice. this world, except maybe high gas prices. Guys, guys, read your Bible, brother. I mean, out of the gate, people die. Take a look at, I'm, I'm going to prophesy for you, because this is true. During the tribulation, one half of the population of this world will be wiped out. So how, do you, how can you say that? That's what the Bible says. For just to do the math easy, there are 8 billion people on this earth, correct? Okay, look what it says in chapter 6, and look at verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse... And his name that sat on him was Clint Eastwood. I'm, I'm, I'm using a modern translation. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed him. Now watch, the power is given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with, death and with beasts of the earth. One fourth of this world. All right, now, if you've got eight billion people, two billion is a fourth. 
That is a fourth of this nation, of, of this world. Look at chapter 9. Now, let me ask you a question. That leaves 6 billion, right? Okay, what's 2 billion out of 6 billion? It's a third. Look at verse 15. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Look at verse 18. By these, uh, by these three was the third part of men killed by fire and by smoke and by brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Guys, when there's eight billion people, two billion is a fourth, and a fourth of them die. When you got six billion, two billion is a third, and a third of them die, you're now down to four billion people. One half of the population of this world's going to die. And I hear guys talk about the first part of tribulation like, oh, you know, your mother-in-law might move in. Actually, I think four billion people dying isn't near as severe. Um, here's what I'm telling you guys. That's in the first half. Now, here's what the first half of tribulation is. It is God dropping it on this, on this world for the way they have treated his son, him, and his people. Then you have the middle of the tribulation. Take a look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 30. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30, <clears throat> look at verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he should be saved out of it. The second half is, now please understand, all seven years are going to be God having a free fire zone on the earth in general. And Jews will get the free fire zone. They'll be in the, living in the free fire zone just as much as anybody else. You know, um, uh, you, you know, your pastor uh, was a fighter, and I was a fighter. And I don't know if you understand that the, the object of a fight isn't to kill your opposition. It's to break their will. Remember that old thing? Hold them down. Say, uncle. Say, uncle. I'll let you up. That's breaking their will. You hit them until they go, peace, brother. Okay? And we, you know what? You know why there's no peace in the Mideast? How did we, how did this nation manage to whip Germany and Japan, two nations that actually had armies and men that would fight? How did we whip them both at the same time in four years? And we've been fighting a bunch of camel jockeys wearing some Italian restaurant's uh, tablecloth on their head for 24 years? I'm going to tell you why. Here's how you don't win a fight. Punch a guy and go... You know, I have great respect for you. And hit him again and go, you know, I owe you a lot. Hit him again and go, you know, you've got a proud heritage. You're really a great person. We have never broken those people's will. What they should do, look, I, you know, you say, well, I just don't want to see any collateral damage. Here's what they should have done in Iraq. First off, we shouldn't have a war that we don't declare. Then once we declare it, tell everybody in Iraq, Hey, we're aiming at the military, we're aiming at the government, but we just want to let you know that if you're inside the border of the country, you're in the wrong place. And you may just be collateral damage. And quit apologizing for it. So, so, the, so all seven years is going to be that free fire zone. But here's what's going to happen. I was talking with your pastor uh, at, at lunch. <clears throat> you know, I, I can't tell you this is what's going to happen. But the world has to embrace the Antichrist. Isn't that right? Which means he's got to do something that the world says, this is our guy. Okay, what's he going to do? Uh, let me tell you, there is not a man on this earth. There is, the devil is not going to take care of the financial problems of this world. I mean, if a guy could, the whole world would be, they'd be indebted to him. But let me ask you a question. Other than some disease, what's the greatest cause of death today? It's called Islam. They're killing Christians, they're killing Jews, they're killing communists, they're killing, they're killing Muslims, they're killing Buddhists, they're killing Hindus, they're killing everybody. All right? What if, and, and it scares me because we got a president kind of talking like this, and I'm for him, all right? But what if a guy says this, a world leader says to, 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 the, to the Muslims, we have had it with you, we're not kowtowing to you, we're not treating you good anymore, we're going to hammer you, and pounds them to sand. 
then looks over at Israel, first off, the whole world, even the guys are saying, oh, we need to be there first, be people of, uh, a, a people of peace. Hey, you know what they'd say? Man, we're glad they're done. Well, we're glad they're gone. You think that bunch of spineless people in France wouldn't at least say, we're glad they're gone? All right? And if that happened, and then that guy says, he looks over to Israel and says, now look, you don't have to worry about them attacking anymore. We hammered them Muslims. You are safe. You are free. Go and build your temple. Tell you what, when you get it done, I'll come for the dedication if you don't mind. Sure, we'd like that. And halfway in the middle of this thing, he goes to Jerusalem for the dedication of that temple. I mean, hey, they can knock that big dome down anytime they want after that, wouldn't they? And he says, well, I bet you guys did a nice job. Yeah, we could have done this without you. Yes, sir. I want to see what the inside looks like. Well, no, you can't go in. Oh, yeah, I can. No, you can't. Whoa, 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 that's a holy holy. You can't. You are allowed in there. And he sits down on the mercy seat and says, I'm allowed in here because I'm God. Yeah, you're right. And they go, no, you aren't. And he said, I'll kill you. So the last half is the time of Jacob's trouble. The last, and, and you know what I read, I'm not sure, but that the persecution against Israel isn't, just look at Matthew 24. We will look at that later this week. It seems like it's basically against the Jews who are in Palestine, who are in Israel, the physical Israel today. But guys, the tribulation, the first half and the last half, the, you know, it's going to be a free fire zone, but the first half you could say is, is uh, the world is going to be the, the main target. And the last half, not only are they getting dropped on by everything else that God's dropping on the earth, but now they are, they're getting the, 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 the uh, intentional focus of genocide by the Antichrist. It's time of Jacob's trouble. It's not time of your trouble. Man, this time of your trouble, isn't it? Really, isn't it? Yeah. So, we are, we are it, it, the tribulation is the punishment on the world, and it is the punishment on Israel. Um, go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, I believe in the, in the pre-tribulation rapture because we're out of here when this all takes place. We're out of the picture. Now let me tell you one of the biggest problems you've got. Man has a problem with this. I don't know if Gentiles are... Uh, are worse about it than anybody, anybody else, but, but we have a problem with pride. You know, I, I, you talk about Gentiles, they think they're the center of everything. Oh, God was thinking of me. Probably not. Oh, God is weeping if you don't get saved. I guarantee he's not. You hear this, oh, you know, they're going to put you in hell and God's going to, he's going to say, fool, you should have trusted me. You know what, I'm, I can't prove this, and I'm not sure, but I'll find out. I am not sure that when the last, when that white throne judgment, not the one you and I are going to be at, but when the white throne of the lost, when those people get judged, when God says, now you go to hell, I am not sure that a lost man's last word to God will be, amen. Because after God lets them see what they have done through his eyes, I'm telling you, they may just say, yeah, I'm gone, I deserve it. But we're Gentiles, and we think, we think we're the center of everything. And you're not. You're not. In fact, you know now, you may not like what I'm about to say, but, but um, you know what you are? Oh, yeah, your dogs and your uh, aliens, Ephesians 2, your strangers, foreigners. You are barbarians. I feel so at home. But here's the thing, guys. Now, now what I'm about to tell you didn't take place exactly, but, it, but this is kind of how it went. You know, up in heaven, nobody ever said, before the Lord came down here, nobody ever said, let's go to the throne and see Jesus. They said, let's go to the throne and see the Word. The Father of the Word and the Holy Ghost. He didn't get the name Jesus until he got to the manger. Now, here it is. Mary is down there in that manger. She's down there in that stable. She is in labor about to give birth to our Lord. And in heaven, the word stands up and heads for heaven's door. Because he's got to go down there. And as he, as he heads across heaven, the Bible says the angels look into this and can't figure it out. And can you see one of the angels you know, going, uh, uh, Lord, Lord, uh, can you... Uh, 
Uh, me and the boys have been talking. We can't quite figure out what you're going down there for. Could you explain this to us? And Lord, the word turned around and says, yeah, yeah, well, here's, here's the thing. You know, the Father has told his people, Israel, our people, that one of these days he's going to send me down there to be their deliverer, their Messiah. And he said, right now, see that woman down there in labor? Uh, well, she's about to have a baby, and that's going to be me. She'll have that baby in about uh, one minute and five seconds. Four seconds, three, three seconds. You, you just a little under a minute. Anyway, and so... Uh, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to be born in that manger, and then when I'm 30 years old, I'm going to present myself to Israel. They're going to accept me. I'm going to reestablish the kingdom, and I'm going to rule the universe from the throne right there in Jerusalem. And he puts his hand on the doorknob of heaven, and one of them angels just comes up with the craziest thought in the world. Did you ever come up with a crazy thought? And he says, Lord, yeah. Uh, one more question, Yeah. What if Israel doesn't accept you? I'll think of something. Do you know what your salvation is? You bunch of so proud, important Gentiles. You are a part of God's divine plan B. Because Israel rejected their Messiah. I never say this. Be careful of your words. I never say I am glad that Israel rejected their Messiah. I do say I am thankful. Because, boy, we got into something, didn't we? But here's what happened. When, when, when Israel rejected their Messiah, you've seen this before. Take a look at chapter uh, 11, Romans, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am a, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke uh, to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of, receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy and the lump is, uh, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree. Now, I hope some of you got saved when you were five. I hope some of you got saved when you were six. If you're here and you got that testimony, you've got the greatest testimony in this building. Look, some of you, your preacher's children, uh, some of you, your, your folks have been this this church from day one or, or whatever, and some of you were born into your family, you were brought up in this church, and you got saved at a young age. I want you to know you got the very best testimony in the world. You know, guys like me, they, we come to a meeting, guy gets up and says, before I got saved, you know, I was a drunk and I was a dope dealer and I was a biker and I was a Democrat and, and um, <laughs> you know, all these ungodly things. And, you know, your pastor gives his testimony. You know what happens? Somebody says, well, I don't have a testimony. If you've never been where we've been, you've got the best testimony there is. You really do. You've got the best testimony there is. And you know what? Now, now really... I know when it says, thou being the wild olive tree, sure. I'll bet you he's got a good definition of that word wild. I'll bet he go back before he got saved, he'd give you a description of wild you don't want to hear about. All right? So here we are, we're the wild olive tree. Look at verse 17. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partake us of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now, I am not a horticulturalist. I don't anything know. Yeah, I can pick fruit off a tree. That's it. But you know, they tell me you can like, you can like graft a, preach, uh, a peach branch into an apple tree. And that apple tree will have apples on one side of it, and this one branch will have peaches. I don't know. But if they can do it, good for them. Or something, something, you know. And... Um, uh, you say, what is it? Now, I would think that's a little tough, getting one kind of fruit to grow on a, on a tree that it's not its native tree, correct? Well, that's what God says. God says that, that Israel is the olive tree, good olive tree, God's olive tree. And then there's you and me, a bunch of barbarians on the other side of the wall. 
You know what? You ought to do this sometime. Read Ephesians chapter 2. Start at verse 11. Read the last, chap, uh, last verse, verse 22. That's where you're called alien. That's where you're called foreigner. That's where you're called stranger. That's where it says there was enmity between us and God. You know what God said in that chapter? He said those people were aliens of the covenants of Israel. You weren't part of them. You were an outsider. We were so bad. Come on, guys, you've heard it. Any scripture, but you know the truth. Fences make good neighbors. And we were so bad. You know what God said? He'd come down here with Israel. He said, I want to be with you guys, but man, them dogs are barking so loud. Let's put up a wall of partition. And we'll let them barbarians party over there. I'll just come down here and be with you. And then the Bible says this. Jesus Christ came down here. And he went to the cross and he was crucified and he rose again three days and three nights later. Now, let me tell you about a, about a meeting I had in Baltimore, oh, about 25 years ago. I flew in, pastor picked me up, and I can't remember what the motel was. It was a brand, national motel brand. And, and he apologized on the way over there. He says, uh, he says, look, brother, I'm sorry, but he said, I'm taking this motel and I found out they're, re they're doing some remodeling there. And he said, I'm sorry if there's like it's dusty or loud this week. I said, no problem. So there's the sign. We pull into the parking lot and there's no building. Where the building was is a pile of rubble that would probably go from the ground to the bottom of that, that, that balcony there. Now you say, oh, you mean they tore down building A and you were staying in building B. I'm telling you, they tore down building A and there was no building B. This is the only building and it's gone. I mean, it's nothing but a long pile of rubble. And we pulled in, I said, Whoa, which is my pile? <laughs> well, <clears throat> here's what happened. He had the right franchise, he had the wrong location. Thank God. <laughs> we went, went down, some other one, and, and yeah, they were doing some paint work and stuff. It was, it was a lot more comfortable than that pile of rubble. But I never, ever forgot that picture of where that building had been and that pile of rubble was left behind it. And the Lord Jesus Christ came out of that grave three days and three nights later. The Bible says he broke down that wall of partition. You know what he did? He came out of that grave and he walked right up over top of that rubble and he came right back down and he grabbed you and me by the hand a bunch of dogs and barbarians and foreigners and strangers and aliens. He grabbed you and me by the hand and he said, come on, I want you to meet my dad. And then hand in hand, we went up over top of that pile of rubble. And you ever, you ever had somebody about to stand up, to go stop you from doing something? And I think we would have just walked in the presence of God and God Father would stood up like this and son held up a nail scarred hand and said, it's okay, Father. He's with me. And we were reconciled. And you know what, son? Read that, read those, read those verses, read those verses. You start out and, hey, are we allowed in the house of God? I'm talking about the temple. Were we allowed in the house of God? As Dan tells, no, sir, no, sir, not at all. And you know what the Bible says in verse 22? We are the house of God. Man, how's that from going from an alien and a barbarian and a stranger and a foreigner and, and somebody that wasn't allowed in the house of God? I am a habitation of God. That's what it says. That's a, that's a major change, isn't it? Say, what is that? That's a wild olive branch been grafted into a good olive tree. Verse 18, remember this word. Boast. Remember that word. Boast. You say, well, boasting is when somebody tells you how good they are. No, that's your definition. Bible definition, boasting is when somebody says, I'm the replacement for Israel. That's why it says in the last days men will be, they'll be boasting. That's what it's talking about. Boast not thyself, see? Boast not thyself against the branches. Oh, God, God kicked Israel out and replaced them with me because I'm so much better. Boast not thyself against the branches. But if thou bear, boast, thou, uh, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. That's what's wrong with us. We think God needs a man of my caliber. Yeah, 22 blank. Hollow point. That's what you think. Well, you know, God needs you. God doesn't need you. 
when Jesus Christ was on the Mount of Olives that night that he was arrested and he said, Lord, let Father, let this cup pass for me. If the Father would have said, Son, you're right. Come on home. Let them all go to hell. Heaven will still be heaven because he's there. You aren't adding a thing to it. Right. Well, you think it's not going to be heaven if you don't show up? Man, quit looking in your mirror so much. Look at verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. It's not because you had something to offer. They messed up. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Now, I told you, I don't know anything about grafting. But if I, if I take this apple tree and I trim off a limb and I put a peach tree limb in there, that's got to be some tough stuff. But if I cut that peach limb off, I'll bet it's easier to put the apple tree limb back in. Verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he not also uh, uh, spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. For toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature, come on. Contrary to nature? You being a church preacher on a Sunday night, wouldn't that be a little bit contrary to nature? Guys, you know, sometimes... Sometimes I like, I like to be in church. Sometimes I do uh, a meeting and it'll be like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I love to be in church on Saturday night. I, that's my favorite night to be in church, Saturday night. You know why? Because I look at a crowd on Saturday night and I think, I know what some of these people used to be doing on Saturday night. There are people sitting in this room right now, when you were lost, if somebody would have said, you know, someday you're going to be in church on Saturday night. We wouldn't even record your response. Isn't that true? You say, Why? contrary to nature this is contrary to nature come to come to church get three services on Sunday come Monday come Tuesday come Wednesday come hear about a Jew out of a Jewish book isn't that true that is so contrary to nature none of you were thinking about it before you got saved Look at verse 24. But if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, what's the next two words? Doesn't say permanent. It says in part. Blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You know what God said? He said, Israel messed up. I'm setting them aside. I'm using you Gentiles. But you Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles is going to come in. And I'm going to get them back. So all these people think they're Jews. God is going to use the Jews again. That right there says they're coming back. And so guys, this is all going to happen. And, and have we not seen this? Have we not begun to see uh, God's, God's dealing with Israel again? You know, he brought them in the land in 48. I don't know if you realize it, May 14th, 1948, Israel for the first time in several, in about a thousand years was, was uh, considered a nation, declared a nation. The next day, 15, 14 Arab nations attacked that little country. 14 Arab nations jumped a day old baby. Not only did Israel whip them, but when they got done whipping them, they had more land than they had on the 14th. Amen. Can I just give you a little challenge? I'm not a challenger. I'll give you a challenge. Because I don't think you ever look at things and think. You know, you guys are in Vietnam. You see maps and had South Vietnam, North Vietnam. I'm telling you, as soon as the, the communists took South, boy, all the maps came out there with one Vietnam, right? And how many times, guys, how many times? I mean, I think they got it now where some of these, where some of these nations in Africa, they just got the name on the map in Velcro. I was, uh, I was in the airport, and I went to buy something, and this guy had a little black man there. He had a little bit of a foreign accent. I said, where are you from? He said, Togo. I said, oh, Togo? Togo? I said, oh, man. I said, we Americans love Togo. He goes, you do? I said, oh, yeah. I said, we love your country. Your country is such a great benefit for our country. He goes, really? I said, yeah. 
I said, only here we call it to go. Is it? Is it? What? Okay, anyway. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, God has set Israel aside. He is using us. He's going to get out because we have gotten proud and we have been against him. And he's going to reestablish Israel. Okay, 1966. Six-day war. The Jews went against three nations and won. 1973. Uh, the the uh, Egyptians came across the Suez Canal. They were, the, the Jews were unprepared during the Yom Kippur War. Boy, they drove on them. Uh, and, and you know what happened? Inside of about two weeks, uh, Ariel Sharon was across the Suez with the second army or third army and had the, the second uh, uh, Egyptian army surrounded and was headed for Cairo. You say, what is that? That's a miracle. Uh, 1982, when the when the Jews went up into Lebanon to keep those Muslims from dropping rockets on northern Israel, uh, Syria started, started uh, attacking Israel, and they said, we will never negotiate a peace. And the next day, Israel shot down 105 planes, and the next day, Syria said, let's negotiate peace. <laughs> it was September of 2014, just a few years ago, my wife and I went over to Israel, and I don't know if you know what was going on, but in September of uh, 2014, uh, all those, look guys, you don't have to be a prophet to see what was going to happen. When, when this country and the United Nations forced Israel to give Gaza back to the Palestinians, we said it's not going to, oh, land for peace, land for peace. Give them land, still no peace. And we said all Gaza is going to be is a launching place for missiles and rockets into Israel. And that's exactly what was going on in September uh, of 2014. We were supposed to go over to Israel with 16 other people. A dozen of them bailed out. They didn't want to go to this. Kathy says, are you worried? I said, no. I said, because Israel's punching them out now. And I said, here's what's going to happen. I said, uh, it, the Palestinians are attacking. Now the Jews, once the Jews are attacking the Arabs, you don't have to worry. They'll whip them. And I said, we're going to get there like two fighters between rounds. They're going to be sitting in the corners going, and we'll just go see Israel and we'll get our plane going and they'll come back. <laughs> and that's what happened. But they, they whipped them again. And you know, I saw this, uh, I don't know if you saw the headline, but this was a, a, a Muslim complaining. He said, their God is, chasing, is changing the course of our missiles, our rockets in air. Now, if I had said that, you know what I think? Next, I think I'll join them. I mean, if the guy's got half a brain, he knows to get on the winning side. And here's what happened. They fired, what they wanted to get was Tel Aviv Airport. And they fired two rockets at the, the or missiles at Tel Aviv Airport. Uh, Israel shot two Patriot missiles at them and missed. And there's 30 seconds. It takes them another minute to cycle another Patriot. There's no way they can get the shots off to stop these two missiles from hitting Tel Aviv. And it said all of a sudden a wind came out of the east and blew them both in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Guys, you know what you say? What are you doing? What are you saying? I'm saying we are, we are watching the beginning of God going back to dealing with Israel. And we're going to be gone. We're going to be out of here. I'm going to tell you why I'm a, I believe uh, in a pre-tribulation rapture. Go to Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 24. Because Matthew chapter 24, where the mid-tribulation rapture is taught, is not for us. Guys, you know, uh, one of the things I tell people, let me ask you a question. I mean, don't you get some verses in the Bible that God wrote for you and they're a blessing? Man, I got a ton of verses in the Bible that God, that, that God, I can take inspirationally. Some of them were intended for me. He has given me so many verses in the Bible, I don't have to hip check Israel out of the picture and pick their pocket and try to take some of theirs. I'm satisfied, satisfied with what I got. And I want you to see the, 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 the parallel between Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 24. And really what Matthew chapter 24 is, a, is it's a continuance of Matthew chapter 10. Look at chapter 10. Uh, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Wait, 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 wait. You know what you think? You think all that healing that Jesus did was humanitarian, don't you? 
That was Jesus just being compassionate and nice. Hey, listen, he is compassionate and he's nice. But you know what, it, what those were? Those were the credentials of the Messiah. We know that Israel rejected their Messiah, but don't you think, don't you think somebody had to be keeping a scoreboard every time a guy showed up and said, I'm the Messiah? There'd be, there'd be many people that had said, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. And I really believe this. I believe there's some guy, you know, some Jew, every time somebody said, uh, I'm the Messiah, you know what he said? Maybe he is. Let's find out. Okay, uh, what tribe are you? Naphtali. Okay, done. Got to be tribe of Judah. Guy's out. Another guy comes along and said, uh, what tribe are you? I'm Judah. Oh, well, okay, that's, that's a good one, okay. Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Gaza. Oh, you're gone. So Jesus shows up. And somebody says, well, you think he's the Messiah? Well, I don't know. He'd have to be the tribe of Judah. He is. Huh. Yeah, but he had to be born in Bethlehem. Yeah, he was. You know one of the credentials of the Messiah was he had to be a miracle worker? Sure. Now look, guys, that's not me saying it. I am going to show you from the Bible. So this, these miracles, these miracles were not just humanitarian acts. They were the credentials of the Messiah. Right. Now, uh, he, names the, he names the 12, verse 2 and 3 and 4. And look what he says in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, Oh, look at this. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the cities of the uh, city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Guys, if the kingdom of heaven is salvation by grace, Jesus Christ just said he never wants you in heaven. Right? All right. He said, don't go to the Gentiles in chapter 10. Right? Just go to the Jews. Keep that in mind. Look at chapter 12. Look what it says in verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show forth judgment. Who? I thought he said two chapters ago, don't go to the Gentiles. Now he says they're going to the Gentiles. Keep reading. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man... Hear his voice in the streets, bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench, till, the, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in, the, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, guys, think about this. Chapter 10, he says, don't go to the Gentiles. Chapter 12, he says, you're going to the Gentiles. Now, could that be a contradiction? I mean, that view, could it not look a little bit contradictory? Except for one thing. What is between 10 and 12? What is? 11. You better go to chapter 11. And here's this guy, and he's got this checklist. And somebody says, uh, well, you think he's the Messiah? Well, I don't know. Uh, he had to come from the tribe of Judah. He does that. Uh, he'd have to be from, born in Bethlehem. He is that. Uh, he'd have to work miracles. He's doing that. Look what it says. Chapter, chapter 11, look at verse 1. And John, the Baptist, got a little upset with him. Now, come on, guys, if you were the forerunner of Jesus Christ and they threw you in jail, wouldn't you think, Jesus will bail me out? It came to pass, verse 1, when uh, Jesus had made an end of com uh, commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Uh, now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, <clears throat> he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I heard, a, I heard some guy trying to expound on it. He said, well, he'd forgotten. John the Baptist had forgotten that Jesus was the Messiah. Somebody like this says that. I always think there must have been a head injury somewhere in the recent past. Because if there's not, then they're stupid. Because look what it says. Now, they ask him, are you the one? You know what he's saying? He's smacking Jesus in the mouth. Are you the one, or are we looking for another? Now, here's the problem. You don't smack Jesus in the mouth because he knows how to smack back. And watch. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again these things which ye do hear and, and see. Now, remember, what's the question? Are you the Christ? 
The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Guys, you see, those things are not just humanitarian acts. They are, they are the earmarks, they are the credentials of the Messiah. Look at the next verse. And blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. Give that back to him. <laughs> and he smacked him back. So here's this guy, and he's got this checklist, and he says, uh, you think he's Messiah? Well, he'd have to be from Judah, and he is. He'd have to be born in Bethlehem, and he was. Uh, he'd have to be a healer, and he is. So you think he's a Messiah, huh? Um, I am 100% sure he can't be the Messiah. Why? Because I've got one check here that I've got to check yes, and I cannot check it yes. What is it? Well, it says here that before the Messiah shows up, Elijah is going to show up before him, He's going to be his forerunner and tell us that the Messiah is coming and nobody named Elijah ever came. That guy John the Baptist came and we even asked him, are you Elijah? He said, nope, not me. So now he's here, so Elijah can't come and precede him because he's already here. So man, I, I thought this guy was it, but he can't be the Messiah. That's the one thing preventing Israel from accepting him as their Messiah. And he deals with that in chapter 11. Look at verse 7. And as he departed, Jesus began to say, Unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed, shaking it with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Stop for a second. Look here. I believe this, the guy with the checklist. The guy that says, he, uh, he can't, I wish he was, but he can't possibly be. I'll bet when the Lord quoted that verse, that old boy went, yeah, yeah that's, that's the one. That, that, that's the one about Elijah. Verily I send you among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Watch. For all the prophets and, and law and the law prophesied unto, until John watch, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know what Jesus Christ just said? If you will accept John as Elijah, I'm here. I'm your Messiah. You don't always say it this way at that moment. Now, I am a King James Bible believer. I wouldn't change a word. I wouldn't change a comma, semicolon. You know what I wish I could do? I wish I could retypeset it. Because if I could retypeset it, there'd be a space about that big between verse 15 and verse 16 because there is a history-changing silence. Because he told Israel, and they got it. They knew exactly what he said. He said, if you'll accept John as Elijah, then I'm your Messiah. You guys want me? And I always say they sat there like a spastic at an auction. They're afraid to scratch their nose lest they bought something. And Israel just whistled in the wound. Because look at verse 16. He goes off in another direction. He's a 90 degree and he's mad at him. But what, whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. He, he jumps right on them. And the kingdom of heaven just slipped through their fingers. So in chapter 10, he said, Just go to the Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Hey, Israel, I'm here. And they didn't say anything. They didn't accept him. Chapter 12, he said, Okay, boys, go to the Gentiles. Hey, look how chapter 11 ends. Come unto me, all ye Jews. All ye that labor and heavy laden. By the end of that chapter, it's opened up to you and me. Guys, those three verses, brother, they touched my heart. They touched my heart when I was lost. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, go back to chapter 10 and get chapter 24. And in chapter 10, he sends them out. And what does he say? He says, verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what he's telling them? Israel, what you have been waiting a thousand years for is 
It's right here. It is about to happen. That's got to be exciting to them, right? And then they messed up. In chapter 11, they rejected him. In chapter 12, he said, go to the Gentiles. What happens in Matthew chapter 13? The kingdom goes into a mystery form. So much so that when you go over to John chapter 6 and he feeds the 5,000, you know what it says? They're about to make him king. And he says, uh-uh, I better get out of here because that thing's already over. They had their chance. Lady, it's like your husband saying, will you marry me? You say no. And then tomorrow you call him up and say, I will. It's too late, honey. That was yesterday's offer. Really, that's what happened. Now it goes in mystery form. But look what it says in chapter 10. And look at verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He's talking to Jews there, right? So he, twel he sends 12 men out to tell the Jews the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Do you know at the time the Lord sent them out, do you know where he found most Jews? In Israel. I mean, that'd be a good place to find Jews, wouldn't it? Uh, 71 miles by, I think, 100 and, uh, 150 miles. Uh, there were only a few million people on the earth at that time, near as they can tell. So he sent 12 men, just that little place, to tell the Jews the kingdom of the heaven is at hand. Do you know that as I speak to you, there is a nation of Israel on this earth, correct? You also understand that there are more Jews in New York City than there are in the nation of Israel right now? You know, I told you there's over 8 billion people on this earth. And the kingdom of heaven still got to come. So now look at Matthew chapter 24. And look what he says in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, I hear people say, well, that is our, our justification for world missions. Guys, I think our justification for world missions is there's lost people all around the world we're supposed to do the job. I, I believe Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 is our justification, okay? But this is, but you know who's getting this commission? 144,000 guys. You say, why 144,000? Well, how come... How come 12 could do it before and now it's 144,000? Because these are generation Y and they're a bunch of idiots. No, no, no. Um, because now you got 8 billion people and there's Jews all around the world. So the first half of that tribulation, they're going to be going around them Jews. You know what they're going to be saying? Get ready, guys. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And look at the verse before the one I just read to you. Look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. It's the same context, guys. Matthew chapter 24, why would you want to put yourself in Matthew chapter 24? I tell folks, I said, if you don't understand your Bible, then you're going to get to Matthew 24 and think you're going halfway through the tribulation. That's exactly what the guys that are teaching that mid-tribulation rapture, they don't know their Bible. They don't have any idea. Man, I mean, you talk about the blind leading the blind. I mean, it might be the blind leading the sighted. I don't know, but I'm telling you, it is not for us. Go to, I'll tell you why I'm a, I believe in the, Pre-tribulation rapture, just two more. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Well, I'm sorry, I get 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You're still in the neighborhood. Now, you know what the, the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, every single chapter ends with some reference to the Lord coming back. And he says this in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Guys, the tribulation is going to be God's wrath on this world. Okay? He has delivered us from the wrath. Now, let me explain something about the wrath. In your Bible, and we'll talk more about this, uh, let's see, uh, maybe tomorrow night. Mm, no, no, maybe, maybe Wednesday night. But um, there's two kinds of tribulation spoken of in the Bible. There is regular tribulation. You've had tribulation, have you not? Man, I mean, you're just going to have tribulation. You're going to have problems. Isn't that true? They're just things that happen. So there are problems that we all have that the Bible refers to as tribulation. Then there is a time on this earth that gets the definite article it's not tribulation, it is the 
tribulation. That's that seven year period that we're going to get out before it starts. There is never a time when the, the definite article is put in front of wrath like, like it is a title for a period of time. The wrath. Yeah, it says the wrath here, but it's talking about, it just says, uh, even Jesus which delivered us from wrath to come. I mean, he's just saying the wrath to come. It's not, the wrath is not a title like the tribulation. Do you understand? Look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, we are going to be gone before God unloads his wrath on this world. There is a period of time, 10, 11, or I'm sorry, seven years called the tribulation. There is not a period called, a three and a half year period called the wrath. But that's what those guys got to say. They call the last three and a half years the wrath. Well, if it is, it's on the Jews. It's not on you and me. Now, guys, the Lord has said we're getting out before the trouble. Why do you want to stay? I mean, really, you know, why do you want to stay? You know, I think part of it, part of it is that we've got a victim mentality now. Everybody wants to be a victim. And maybe you want to be a victim. Uh, I want you to go to Titus chapter 2. Oh, stay right here and uh, get, get, get 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but go to Titus chapter 2. And get Hebrews chapter 11. Now I mentioned this morning, you know, this word rapture. You know, people, they, they spring that on you. You believe in the rapture and that word doesn't even appear in the Bible. Well, that's true. I believe in, I believe in the event that, we, that, that the word rapture describes. And, and that's why I kind of... I, I kind of stay away from rapture. Uh, the reason I talk about it, I use the word rapture for it when I do this conference because, because of the common acceptance of the term. Personally, when I talk to people, I use what is called in Titus chapter 2, look at verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness, that denying ungodliness, that denying ungodliness, oh, I'm sorry, that isn't there three times. I just thought some of you need to hear it three times. And if there's some mindless doofus from some Christian uh, theme park listening right now, you need it four times. Denying worldly, uh, ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you don't want to call it the rapture, that's fine. Call it the blessed hope. I like that term. Do you know the difference between faith and hope? There's a difference between faith and hope. If, if you were arrested, let's say you were arrested, uh, they said, you know, there was a bank robbery and, uh, and we are sure you're the guy. And they arrest you. Wouldn't you say, well, I have faith the Lord's going to get me out of this. Right? But the next day your lawyer comes and says, I'm filing a motion. As soon as I leave here, I'm filing a motion I'm going, and I'm going to the court and I'm going to show them this is the guy that actually did it. And, and, and you should be out. Now, you have had faith that the Lord is going to get you out. But when you hear your lawyer, your lawyer is filing this motion, that motion becomes your hope. In other words, God's going to get me out, and this is the way he's going to do it. Guys, God is going to get us out of the mess that's coming, and our hope is the rapture. Now, some of you are going to miss tribulation, and it's not going to be the rapture. Say, really, how? You're going to die. Wouldn't you rather have the rapture? <laughs> Believe me, everybody that died, they're missing the rapture. I mean, they're missing the tribulation, correct? Yeah. But really, that dying part, I told you this morning, that dying stuff, and we aren't too keen on that. Death is okay. Dying isn't exciting. So we, have a, we don't have a hope. We have a blessed hope. So call it the blessed hope. Uh, if you don't want to call it the blessed hope, then go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Then if you don't want to call it the rapture, and you don't want to call it the blessed hope, call it the catching away. Are we going to be the catching up? 
Some of you ain't caught up yet. But the fact is, guys, you can call it the catch. I hear people say that. They say they, they don't like to use the term rapture. They call it the catching away. That is a scriptural term. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I like this verse. And whenever, whenever I read this verse, I have to tell you the truth. I'm glad I have an NIV. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got, I got in the back of my truck, I got two briefcases and I've got an NIV and a New King James and a New American Standard and a uh, Good News Modern Man and a uh, New World Translation and a New King James. Yeah, two of them because they're both different. And I got about eight different translations and I have this, I, I use them to show what's wrong with them. But the, but the New International is a scream, brother. It's a scream. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Some of you will understand. Watch verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Enoch was translated to heaven. Correct? Guys, guys, guys. The word translate appears five times in the Bible, three places. The first place is 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. A kingdom is translated. The second place is Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, where it says we are translated from the power of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. We call that salvation. Then the third place in the last three times are right here. Do you know what the New, New International says right there? I love it. Kind of. I'll paraphrase, but here's how it says. It says, by, by, by faith, Enoch was taken that he should not see death and was not found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And it says God had taken him away. And every time I read that, I go back to a song when I was a kid. Some of you remember? They're coming to take me away, ho, ho. They're coming to take me away, hee, ha. Now, let me ask you something. You want to go to heaven? Do you want the Lord to come back and take you? I mean, you want to go, you want to go tonight? Okay, if he comes back tonight, what do you want? Do you want to be translated to heaven tonight or do you want to be taken as you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give you one good reason why you want to be translated to heaven and not taken in the body you're in. That ceiling. You guys on the balcony are really in trouble. <laughs> but really, think about that. Let me ask you a question. Can you? I heard this. This. I don't even know if they let this guy use sharp things when he eats. He got up out of pulpit one time. Of course, he's preaching out of a New King James, so he didn't have any sense. Uh, don't, don't you know these guys that try to? They're, they're spectacular. They try to dazzle you. And he goes, "I want you people to know that this pulpit is not solid." Now I know what he's going to say. Okay, I heard the spiel before. And his spiel is, this is made up of molecules and atoms that are moving. And so because they're moving, it's not solid. And, he, and so you'll sit there and go, wow, the pulpit, it's not solid. Quit drinking that Kool-Aid. <laughs> See, here's how I think. Then why don't you put your non-solid head through that non-solid pulpit? If the, your, body can't, your body can't pass through that ceiling. Did you ever think what the rapture would be like if the Lord tried to take us to... <laughs> oh, oh. And about the time the Lord says, uh, hey Gabe, I, I think we're short of you. Hit it again. No! Ooh, head for the, maybe that's why we go up at the last drum. I mean, if you're ever in the middle of a sermon preacher, you hear that trumpet say, head for the door! And hope that you're not in an airplane or a submarine. But you know what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, it said he's going to change this vile body to be likened unto his what? glorious body. And you know, we know for a fact, we know that his glorious body walked right through a wall. Oh, guys, before you could take that piece of paper and slip it between 
the, my shoes and this carpet, I will have a body like Jesus Christ. By the time I get to that ceiling, I'll pass right through it. Sure. Now, I understand that does mess up on your favorite pictures of the, of the rapture. The grave is blowing open. Not going to happen. Ooh, could you imagine? Could you imagine a stiff? And the Lord's going to take him and not change him? They'd be in that coffin. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> change me, change me, change me, change me. <laughs> Boy, it better be in a twinkling of an eye. All them dead guys show up with great big red. Oh, man, that was a rough one. Now, let me tell you what a blessed hope is. I, I kind of mentioned it this morning. You love somebody. You love somebody? I love my wife. Man, I love that lady. I do. I tell her every day I love her. I mean, I really, really do. And I love her so much that I'm going to tell her to go outside and wait for me. And I'm going to let somebody come by and they're going to beat her up. And they're going to abuse her. And they're going to try to kill her. And I love her so much. I'm not going to let that happen to her for seven years. Only three and a half. And then I'm going to come back and grab her. I'm going to say, ain't I your hero? Yeah, right. Let me ask you a question. How could you call having to go through the first three and a half years and then getting out, how could you call your exit a blessed hope? Man, I, you read about some, what, and there may be some firefighters in here, and their people got out of fires, and I mean, they are burnt, and, and they're glad to get out. But it'd been nice to get out for it. Guys, we're going out before it. You know why? Because our hope is blessed. He's not going to leave us here. He, he loves us. He calls us his bride. That's what Paul says in chapter 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. He calls us his bride. And he's going to let his bride here to be molested, to be assaulted, to be murdered, to be abused by a world that hates him and hates him, it, her. And then after three and a half years, he's going to come and say, wasn't that a blessing? <laughs> Actually, no. Where you been for the last three and a half years? Guys, we're getting out of here. You know why? Because it's a blessed hope. Why would you be excited? Oh man, I can't wait. And you know what I've never found? I have never yet found one of these people that believes in the mid-tribulation rapture knows when the, rapture, when the tribulation starts. For some of them, that first three and a half years is about 15 years long. Some of them think they've been in that first three and a half years for 10 years. Guys, I'm not saying that, that we leave at the rapture and the tribulation starts the very next day. There may be a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, I don't know. But us exiting, it's the next thing coming. After we leave, the tribulation is going to start. And that's how you, you know the start because the time of the Gentiles is over and we are out of here. These guys believe in the mid-tribulation rapture? None of them can tell you. Here's the sign of, they can, they can give you all this gloom and doom about all the stuff that's going to be happening in that three and a half years, but a lot of what they're talking about has already gone on. It's going on some of them wars and rumors of wars. I'm telling you, I've heard these guys say it. I, I've heard them say, well, he's got to be coming close. This has got to be just about the end of the three and a half years. Are you out of your mind? I haven't seen one 50-pound block of ice fall out of the sky. Don't tell me that's last half. That's God's judgment on the earth. God don't throw icebergs or, or ice cubes at, at Israel. The water turns to blood. That's not... That, God never turned the water to blood in Egypt against his people. He did it to the Egyptians, the world, not his people. So I'm telling you people, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I got to tell you something else. Every point I gave you, that's a whole lot more than they gave me in Bible college. You say, well, how'd you do it? I set it aside. I said, if this thing's really true, I can safely set it aside and I can come to this book and I'll ask the author and got more reasons for believing I'm out of here before this thing, that thing starts than I ever had with the three verses they gave me in Bible college. Shame on you young men that sang in that choir tonight. Shame on you, you, you uh, students at this college. Shame on you if when you leave here, that's the last time you got anything from the Bible. Shame on you people. If you yourself, now look, you got a good pastor, you got a good church, but shame on you if you are not a student of this book yourself. 
And guys, I am out of here. I'm going to get out of here. And then the tribulation is coming. And if you want to stay here for three and a half years, I got bad news. You're not. You're staying here for seven. Because you're getting my three and a half. You get your three and a half and my three and a half. Because I'm out of here, bucko. I'll eat your fried chicken at the, at the, judgment, at the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb, all right? Guys, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe it because when I come to my final authority in all matters of faith and practice, this book teaches it and reinforces it and reinforces it from every angle I see. We are not going through any part of the tribulation. All right. Preacher. Preacher. Good for us tonight. Go to Matthew 24, if you would, please. And just let me just say this, and we'll go to the house. <clears throat> I've taught you uh, concerning Revelation 4, it was a rapture. These guys that are teaching this stuff are laughing at that. They're, I taught you that you've got to be careful who he's speaking to. You've got to find out who he's speaking to. Three groups, I already gave you that. And I want you to look at, look at 24 real quick. Just, just look at it. I mean, anybody can read and can read the King James Bible ought to be able to pick this out. Uh, he's not speaking to us. He's speaking to the Jews. I know this is boring to you because if it was a ball game or television, you'd want overtime. You watch stupid movies for two hours, but you won't try to learn your Bible. Look at it, if you would, please. Look in, look in chapter 24. Look at verse 3, if you would, please. Mount of Olives. Just pick up some words, just a few words. Um, uh, look on down, uh, if you would, please. Um, look at verse 14. Is that what I got marked here? Verse 14. I, I marked a couple of just a while ago when he was talking about. Uh, look at verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom, that's for the Jew. Look at verse 15. Daniel, it's to the Jew. Look in verse 16. Judea, flee to the mountains. Some people don't have mountains to flee to. That's in Judea. It's in Jerusalem. That's to the Jew. Look in uh, verse 20, unless you still worship the Sabbath. Do you see the Sabbath day? Just go down and start picking some of these words out. Look in verse 22, the Lexate. You go on down and you keep looking at these different, and you've got to conclude that chapter 24 is to the Jew. What I teach you, all Scripture is for us. Not all Scripture is to us. So when you take 24 and try to put it in our situation, you're going to have trouble with it. And that's, that's what the preacher's trying to tell you. And you'll get that as week goes on. It's really amazing how this thing lays out. And it's really silly when people are allowing people to pastor them. I made statements around the nation now and made one in the National Conference the other day that we are letting the Internet and the computers are pastoring our people. That's the craziest thing. I, never shaking the man's hand, people's hand. You don't know their manner of life. You don't know their, their lifestyle. You know nothing about them. You know nothing about their morality. You know nothing about them. And yet, following them because they say some stuff that you like to hear versus what is truth and word of God. Let's stand our feet, please. Thank you, Brother Gip. Good for us tonight. One more time on tomorrow night and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We'll sing one song. We'll get him up immediately. And so... Uh, this teaching and systematic teaching like that just takes a little longer. And so that's, that's how, how it plays out. Now, you might be here tonight without Christ. You have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Aren't you glad that we've been grafted in? Amen. We've done a little of that, me and my daddy, when I was a little boy. Showed him how to do that. Aren't you glad we got grafted in? Aren't, aren't you glad that somewhere, somehow, the Lord put us in his plan? I'm glad for that. I'm happy for that. Really am. But you might be here and you've never been grafted and you've never received the Lord as your Savior. We're going to give you that opportunity right now. We're going to take time for an invitation. I'd be remiss if, if, I, if I wouldn't. So if I head bowed and eyes closed, if you need to trust Christ as your personal Savior tonight, wouldn't it be a wonderful night to do that? We'll take a Bible and show you from God's Holy Word how you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you have a home in heaven when you die. That's the greatest news you'll ever hear ever here. And we're going to give you that opportunity. As we sing the invitation,